say the game is getting old. Monday morning and your coffee's cold. Life is not what you want it to be. You need another chance to. Hi, everyone, and welcome to a new direction. Uh, it's me, Jay Izzo, and oh man, see, do you know what I? You know, what I love about doing this show. Okay, because I tell you every week, right? It's it's going to be a great show, and it is going to be a great show because. I got Ralph Peterson again. Okay, okay. First of all, Ralph Peterson was great. You remember the book we did was Congratulations, Now Get Over Yourself, and and Ralph was fantastic, and his book was great, and it was absolutely outstanding. He's got a new a new book that I guess it's called New. We, let's, we could call it New. He did this book, but then he's rewritten it. It's called Managing When No One Wants to Work. Okay, listen, consultants, managers, business owners, CEOs. Uh, you're going to want to tune into this because how many of you have ever experienced, ever experienced a time when you had employees who didn't want to work? Oh, that many of you. Good for you. So we're going to talk to him today about the book. The book is going to be outstanding, Managing When No One Wants to Work. And we're going to have a lot of fun with him because as you know about Ralph, is Ralph is a absolute fun guy and he's such a wealth of knowledge and has so much experience i mean because he's been managing since he's been 16 years old even for about eight minutes so i mean he's been an awesome so (laughs) (laughs) as you can hear him laughing in the background it's awesome but let's do what we do every week let's check in with you in the four areas of your life you know i believe that we are four-part people i believe that we're physical people mental people emotional people and spiritual people and so i want to check in with you and see where you're at right now today and and wherever you're listening to us on the podcast and if you're watching us live thank you for doing that so physically on a scale of one to ten one being miserable ten being outstanding where would you put yourself physically right now would you say you're uh, a three four five seven eight nine you know how you feeling physically right and and when i'm asking you that question i'm asking about a variety of things i'm not just asking you about you know you know i had the flu i'm asking you about you know are you taking care of your body and you take care of yourself i'm gonna tell you something about ralph and I, I don't think he minds me saying this, but Ralph was way overweight and he worked on himself and changed himself. And he's a guy who is an inspiration, I think, for everyone that you can change physically. You can change yourself. You can change your body physically if you if you want to. And so, you know, he runs these like 5Ks and, and runs these other types of marathon things. I think that's ridiculous, but that's what he does because I'd rather be in the gym on a cycle, but he likes to be out there doing it. And he's changed his body and he's changed the way he ate, eats and, and, and what he puts into his body. And so I want to ask you on a scale of one to 10, where are you at? And then not only where is that number at though, what can you do to get to the next number above where you're at right now? What is it that you need to change? I mean, do you need to exercise? Do you need to watch what you're eating, right? Chances are it's a combination of both. Matter of fact, I heard somebody say to me the other day, you know what? Abs are made at the dinner table. And I thought that was, you know what? You're right. Because a lot of people think, it, you know, you're going to lose weight in the gym. Actually, you're going to probably put on weight in the gym. But you have to change your eating habits as well. So what are you going to do today to get to that next number? All right, you got that number. Great. So how about mentally? Same scale, 1 to 10, 1 miserable, 10 outstanding. Where are you at mentally? And what I mean by that is where are you at in terms of feeding your brain the things that your brain needs to be fed in order to grow? Right? Because one thing about our brain is we can always learn something new. And we have two sides to our brain, right? We have a a right side, which is more of our creative side, and we have a left side, that's our logical side. And what are you, what are you consuming to feed your brain, right? Because so much that we consume today on TV is mindless, right? Did you hear what I said? Mindless, meaning that it's not really, it's not really helping your brain at all. It's not really doing anything to help you grow mentally. You know, this show is a show where I interview, you know, authors, best-selling authors like Ralph, and I interview them, and then we break it down, and we try to find ways to help you do whatever you do better, whether it's something in your life, your career, your business, and we're feeding you. And and the reason why I chose this is because I wanted to feed that side of your, both sides of your brain, creatively and logically. But you could do that in a number of ways. You know, you can read books on your own. You can take up a musical instrument, which requires both sides of your brain, or learn a new foreign language. So where is that number for you? in terms of mentally where where are you at with that on the scale are you a four well how do you get to a five what are you going to do what what are you going to change you know maybe it's turning off the tv and picking up a book that might be a great change for you all right so you got two numbers third number is the emotional part and um, ralph talked about his emotional intelligent quotient sometimes 
isn't always the highest it needs to be. He's talked about in the book. But one of the things is none of our emotional quotients and our emotional intelligence may not be as high, especially when we're doing texting and we're, you know, we're on, you know, we're, we're texting and emailing. Sometimes we don't think about our emotions and how people interpret our emotions. That's all part of emotional intelligence, right? And it's also about how you take things personally. My wife gave me something really great the other day. She, she, she gave me a Q-tip. And you know what Q-tip means? It means quit taking it personally. And I would just really suggest to you, you know what? Why don't you keep a Q-tip in your pocket, all right? Because it's so easy for us to take things personally. And every time that you feel like you need to get upset with somebody, pull the Q-tip out. Quit taking it personally. It might be a helpful, helpful way for you to control your temper or, or getting upset so easily. You know, the other part of emotional intelligence is also how well are you able to relate to the emotions of others. And so I'm going to ask you, right, and that scale of 1 to 10, 1 being miserable, 10 being outstanding, how are you doing emotionally, right? And then what can you do to change it? Because part of that change, and I'm going to just give you a helpful hint, part of the change is just being intentional about what you do with your emotions, okay? And then the final area that I always talk about is the spiritual area. On the scale, scale of 1 to 10, 1 being miserable, 10 being outstanding, where are you at spiritually? And what do I mean by that? Well... We all believe in something. We have faith in something. When you, you have something that drives you in the morning, that feels that you gives you purpose, whether that's God or you feel that you're centered via nature. Some people uh, I know believe that you know they get on a bike ride and that just centers them. Or some people run and they feel that they, that, that helps cent- gets them back to center. Some people work out. Some people believe in karma. Some people believe in a whole variety of things. What is it that centers you and gets you back in that spiritual area? To, and, and if it is God, how's that going? And if it's nature, how's that going? Whatever it may be. So what is that number for you? And then what do you need to do to improve it? Or what do you need to do to change it? And what can you do right now? So you have four numbers. You've got a physical number. You've got a mental number, emotional number, and a spiritual number. Think of those as the four legs of a table. And if you think about that, if it's uneven, and the table's uneven because the legs are uneven, it's hard to eat on a table that's uneven. But also at the same time, if all four of those areas are low, and you're sitting in a normal chair, it also makes it very difficult to eat as well. And we want you to eat healthfully in all areas of your life. So do what you got to do to bring your table up. And that leads me to uh, my next guest, and and it is Ralph Peterson. And Ralph Peterson is a guest of the show. He's a friend of the show. He's not just a guest of the show. He's a friend of the show. He is literally the manager's manager. And by the way, he doesn't just... He, he's a consultant, he's a manager, he is, speaks all over the place, he is in demand. I, and here's the thing about why he's in such demand, because he doesn't work in a field that's very easy, okay? He worked in the housekeeping industry, okay? Imagine how hard it is to manage people who don't want to do housekeeping in hospitals or uh, convalescent centers or things like that. It's a tough job. Well, Ralph has managed to manage it, and he's awesome, and he's brought to us today by Inline Business Brokers and Advisors, and I just want to tell you, we are so grateful for them because they have been an original original sponsor of the show, and they partner with business owners when it's time to sell their business. When it's time to sell your business, contact the professionals at Inline Business Brokers and Advisors. You can learn more at inline.com. It's E-N-L-I-G-N.com. And Linda Craft and Team Realtors. I don't care where you're at in the world. They can help you match yourself up with the right real estate professional to help you sell or buy your next home. And if you're in the Triangle area, you can talk to them personally. Just go to lindacraft.com. It's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T.com. And our T-shirt shout of the week. You know what? Got to thank my friend Kevin Simonson. He was a high school. We played high school football together. He actually was right next to me, and we uh, we played high school football together. We went to college together. And he's a great dude, and he's got this 5K the hard way. You can find that on Facebook. I put that on the Facebook post as well, and I will also post it on the, on the uh, website. But 5K the hard way, if you want to have something fun and you want to do 5K in a very unique and fun and helpful way and build teamwork and just – it, it's it's awesome. It's just one of the neatest things that you'll ever see when it comes to trying to get dirty and muddy in a 5K, and he's 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 in charge of that. So check out 5K the hard way on Facebook, and that leads me to saying, well, guess who's guess who's on now? Ralph Peterson. Well, welcome back to a new direction. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be on. I love 
first of all, I love you, but I and and I, I kind of have a little bit. I don't want people to get too carried away because I do have a little bit of a a man crush on you, um, and I'm okay with that. I'm comfortable. <laughs> it's not your fault. It's yes, your fault. <laughs> I, I got a little bit of a man crush. I have to be honest with you, uh, but I, I and and maybe even a little bit of a bromance. But uh, the the the. the, the <laughs> <laughs> but the view I, that's so funny but the book this book all right we did you know when we did congratulations get over yourself right and you were talking uh, you know about being a manager and the book's funny and just poignant and it's just so good but managing when no one wants to work first of all the title caught me right away and I was like who doesn't deal with that issue I mean, in all your experience, isn't isn't that a common issue for everybody is that trying to manage people who don't want to work? You know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I don't think so because my manager, my managers, most of my life have had it easy with me because I love working. I love producing results. I there are a lot of people just like me who really are really motivated and do love to work. The the challenge is when you work with I don't work with poor workers i don't i don't employ people who are not good workers or they're not motivated or they're not caring or they don't take their work seriously it's just the industry i work in nobody wants to be a housekeeper forever so they're just taking the job for a little bit of time until they find something else anything else and you know because nobody wants to work in housekeeping and so how do you get them and then how do you keep them as long as possible how do you make the work when you're cleaning up after others and cleaning toilets and sweeping them up and floors, how do you get them to tell their friends, Hey, you should go work over here. You know, cause I know you need work. How do you, how do you get somebody to recommend housekeeping to somebody else? Right. Right. By being a good boss. Well, it's really the answer. It, well, but here's the thing though. I think, you know, after reading this book, cause I, you, you know, I try to, I think so silly, deep, deep about things and maybe way too deep. But one of the things I, I was thinking about as a consultant myself, right. And a coach and a business coach, one of the things I, I I don't I've never run across an industry ever I don't think where I've I've ever heard a manager say you know every single one of my employees just works hard all the time they they all no, of course you've, of right course. I mean I've never heard that right yeah and we all deal yeah. I think we all pretty much most of us have dealt with you know I can't get my employees to do what I want them to do because they're not doing the things and then I think about your situation I go well you know nobody wakes up when they're, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old and goes, mom, dad, um, I don't want to be a doctor. I really want to be a housekeeper and I can't wait for that <laughs> moment in my life. I mean, nobody, wait. I mean, we don't, right? I don't, I don't think any, I don't remember anybody going to college going, you know, when I'm done with my psychology degree, I'm going to become a housekeeper because I think that's the best way for me to help people. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so you're, you're absolutely right but it is a noble field it's an honorable field sure. you know work and paying your bills it's it's important so it, but you're absolutely right everybody has everybody struggles with trying to get employees engaged trying to get right. employees to work you know we used to have a big call out issue nowadays we have a big call in issue that's where they right. show up and they still don't do anything <laughs> you know it's it's a challenge right well but it, it's a challenge i think one of the things that I loved about this book was, first of all, the book is broken up into 20, 30, 20, 23, 20, how many chapters was it? 20, 20, so 20 some odd chapters in this book and uh, not counting the conclusion. And each one of these, uh, each one of these, 24. 24, thank you. Each one of these yeah. chapters is a story that is relatable to you. And it's practical, by the way. What Here's how Ralph described it early. <laughs> in the book he said he remembered as a child he used to sit around the campfire where the adults were having an adult beverage and they would tell stories and you couldn't necessarily as they kept drinking you couldn't necessarily tell where one story ended and one story began and he said and he says to you in the book in the introduction to the book that i want you to enjoy this as a campfire story and what's beautiful about the book is that it is one story after another where you kind of put this whole picture together. You're not really sure where one story ends, and I don't think you have to, and one story begins, because they all kind of they all kind of work together, and they all um, center around different issues that we all have to deal with with employees, whether it's firing somebody or whether we're 
uh, you know, having to deal with some, you know, somebody, you know, who is a lower level manager who isn't managing. It, it, I, I love that approach to this book. Was that part of the whole idea was that, you know, I think I got a book here that can relate to anybody in any position. Was that part of that? With you know, process? actually, I think it actually goes back a little further okay. to where, where it's where I really learned how to develop stories. I love telling stories. I just simply, I love writing. I love being able to, you know, describe stories and try to get you hooked in with a conversation right. and the whole process of, of story development is really interesting to me. I really, really love it. And I truly do think this like a, you must have been around a campfire. The next time you're around some sort of social event where people haven't seen each other in a while and right. one story will inevitably perpetuate another, which will right. lead to another and somebody else. Tell, and they're all kind of interrelated. You know, they're all, right. there is this one global, you know, centerpiece of right. all the stories, but every story has got a different tone, a different feel. It's so great. That's, kind of how I approach all of my writing. I just love telling stories and then trying to make them go, they all kind of go together, right? Right, right. right. <laughs> we can well, call it a book. It's the, they do, and they do. That's the thing. It's kind of like this puzzle piece that if you put all these, if you put these 24 chapters together, it's their puzzle pieces and you start fitting this puzzle together and it paints this picture for us, a complete picture of actually how to manage. That's, that's, the, yeah. that's what I think is the beauty of the book. And I, I mean, it's, listen, we could go through every single chapter and we're going to go through a few of them because there's a few stories in there that I really want you to tell. And, uh, because they're just, they're really, really good. And I think these are some of the issues that people deal with and, and I want you to kind of walk ourselves through them, but I also want people to understand about the book. Again, the book is called managing when no one wants to work by Ralph Peterson, who's joining us on a new direction. Uh, and by the way, that is his head in the sand. I'm pretty certain it's his head <laughs> in the sand in the front of this book. I but, do all my own photo stunts. Yeah, all he, my own photo yeah. Stunts. By the way, the, the the back of him. By you may have seen it on the uh, on on my event status. I actually you know photoshopped his picture of him holding the shovel. Uh, I guess as he was digging the hole to put his head in the sand. <laughs> Uh, which was fantastic, <laughs> which he's got his fanny in the air, which is fantastic. And yes, I just said fanny uh, on the show. Uh, and you won't hear that very often either if you were born any time after 1987. So uh, so let, let's, let's, <laughs> let's take it right into this. Let's dig right into this book because the book is, is just a great charmer and I, I love it. And so let's, let's start with you. I think that's the most fun thing to start with mm-hmm. is... Your first management experience starts at 16 years of age, and it's your eight minute uh, or so, maybe a few more minutes than that, of of management. And so why don't we why don't we start with getting personal with Ralph and telling that story first and what you learned from that lesson? Yes. Yeah, so I'm the youngest of four, and it's almost I'm almost the youngest of eight, and and only the reason I say eight, even though there was only four of us is everyone in my family is such a large personality. Everybody tries to outdo everybody else. And when you're the youngest in that group, it seems like there's an entire army in your house. And you, I never was in control of anything. Nobody ever put me in charge of dinner, who I was going to play with, what we were going to play, where we were going to go, what we were, we were going to watch on television. You know, nothing, never. And so when I was 16, I get my first job working for this guy doing lawn mowing, lawn mowing and building retaining walls and whatever. And a few weeks after I start, he, he asks me if I ever thought about being in charge. And so it's maybe two weeks, three weeks of me just constantly thinking what it's going to be like when he actually puts me in charge, because I can't believe he asked me to be in charge. Like you ever thought about being in charge? My head grew to the size of the moon. I was so and. I, I fell in love with being in charge before I ever even just the idea of being responsible about being a hero about people listening to what I have to say. Nobody's ever listening to me, you know, so it was really, <laughs> really, really hyped up in my head. So when the day finally comes and he says, I'm going to leave you in charge today because I have to go to another job and do an estimate or whatever he had to do. I was nervous and I was excited and I was 
scared out of my mind because I didn't know if anybody was going to take me seriously. Everybody was older than me. These were rough kids. I mean, they were lawn mowing, you know, mowing lawns, building retaining walls. So he haphazardly, he doesn't, I'm thinking he's going to make some grand speech, let everybody know how good of a worker I am, how reliable I am, how much faith and confidence he has in me. He didn't say any of that. He just kind of said, <laughs> Ralph's in charge while I'm gone. And he leaves. Like, nobody was paying attention to him. Nobody was, <laughs> like, nobody clapped. <laughs> There was no fanfare. And so I didn't know what to do with myself. So he leaves, and I am I literally stand guard. All of a sudden, I feel like instead of helping and working, and now I'm in charge, so I don't, I don't even know what to do with my hands. So I put them in my pockets, so I cross them over my chest. It's so stupid. you got to keep in mind, I'm 16 years old. It's my first job. It's five weeks into my first job. I'm being put in charge for the first time. And I see this guy, he's it's starting to rain, and he's got a tape measure out, and he's measuring a log, and then he's dragging the tape measure through the mud. And he's trying to, the, the, because the tape measure's through the mud, it won't go back into the sleeve. And I, I yell at him. I go, hey, you're ruining company. You know, all of a sudden, I'm the warden over the company tools. <laughs> you're ruining company tools. And I'm like, you got to dry it off first. He's like, oh, I'm, yeah. So he starts trying to dry it off, but he's doing a terrible job, a terrible employee. And so I go, hey, you're doing it wrong. And so he takes the tape measure without even thinking and just throws it at me and curses and says, you do it. Well, I didn't know what else to do except swing back at him. And so we start basically wrestling, fist fighting on the ground in the mud. And the boss, who had apparently forgotten something, he comes back down the driveway to see this. And I mean, the look of disappointment on his face and I, uh, I mirrored his disappointment. I was like, I know these <laughs> unruly workers. Can you believe this? Tells me to get in the truck. I get in the truck. I got a bloody lip. You know, I'm, I'm all wet now from the mud. He has a brand new truck. I get in the truck and I'm like, listen, this is what happened with the tape measure. And he goes, stop, stop, stop. Goes, you can never be in charge. And he just, brought me home he terminated me on the spot gave me this huge lecture i mean i was trying my hardest not to cry in a truck but of course i'm crying i'm looking out the side window i got fired eight minutes after i got promoted to my first management job and he said you will never ever ever be able to be in charge of people if you think for one minute how tough you are is what makes you in charge like he just totally it took me it, – I never got another management job for like six years. I – anytime time says, hey, does anybody want to take charge? I'm like, I'm not taking charge of anything. I, no, no, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so, so the big lesson for you, you – what was the big lesson for you that you felt that you took out of this that really grew you later to be the, 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 the great manager that you have become? I mean, what, what was the lesson for you out of that that you look back on now? You know, the, the biggest thing, I just had a situation where uh, two weeks ago I had to let go a manager and I had to let go of the manager because she got into a fight with one of her employees. You can't make this up. <laughs> she gets into a fight with one of her employees and I have to let her go. They literally have it on tape. Like people were recording it on their phone. And when, when I brought her into the conference room and I, and I said, you know, I, I got to make today your last day. And she's like, I don't understand why. And I said, well, this video of you fist fighting with one of your employees, she went through great lengths to explain to me how her and that employee are essentially best friends. And that was only a snafu between them and that she had forgiven her and they're all good and they still hang out together. And it's not that big of a deal. So, she doesn't understand why she's getting terminated over it. And I got to tell you, when I was 16, I had the same thought. I was like, right. but it, Randy and I are fine. I mean, we we're just fighting over a stupid tape measure. But it's not like we hate each other. Nobody's right. other than hurt feelings and a swollen lip. No, it, it's nothing. What I didn't understand then and what she didn't understand now is it's not about how I perceive it. Mm. It's how everybody else perceives me. Mm. And if people see you as the brawler or the person who's not reliable or the person who comes in late, in late all the time or leaves early all the time, 
they're simply not going to believe that you have any right to be in charge. And I lost the right to be in charge when I started fighting instead of managing. Wow. Instead of be acting like, you know what? I asked him to do it. He tried to do it. And he wasn't doing a good job at it. I could have easily said, oh, let me help you. I'll do it. Wow. Instead, I tried to exert my authority, my supreme being. <laughs> and, I, and it didn't work out. So that's the biggest takeaway. The biggest takeaway is it's never, never, never about us. It's always about how others see us, though. That's awesome. We're with Ralph Peterson. Uh, by the way, he's a National Association fellow, National Speakers Association um, professional member, uh, along with myself and Corey Kupfer, who, uh, who just gave us a shout out. Hey, Corey, and uh, know Corey a little bit. And he's got uh, Ralph's got this great book and call entitled "Managing When No One Wants to Work." It's an absolutely fabulous read, fun read, intelligent read. It's it's enlightening. It's there's 24 short chapters that that Ralph tells a beautiful story, and then there is at the end of it there is this little piece that you get to take home to go. Okay, this is how I should manage people. I need to think about how I do this. And it's a fabulous book. And he's brought to you today by Inline Business Brokers and Advisors. Inline Business Brokers and Advisors, at some point, you're going to need the service of an experienced business broker. Selling your business is a big decision, so make sure you build your deal team, starting with the experts at Inline Business Brokers and Advisors. I know these folks personally. They are internationally known. I am telling you, these folks are great. If you are looking to buy a business, sell a business, start with the folks at Inline. And you can learn more by going to inline.com. It's E-N-L-I-G-N.com. And also Linda Craft and Team Realtors, no matter where you're at in the world, they can help you get matched up with the right professional to help you buy or sell your home. And if you happen to be in that greater Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, Research Triangle Park area, you can actually meet them in person and they can help you find your next home or help you sell that home and get you what you're looking for. And uh, they are both sponsors bringing us Ralph Peterson and his book, Managing When No One Wants to Work. So one of the stories, I'm going to get into some of these stories because some of these stories are just priceless and, and the titles are just it's so luring. I mean, it was. I'm, I'm like a. I'm like a hungry bass, you know, looking at a lure. Okay, every time you gave me a title, I went, oh. And right out of the shoot, you have this one title called uh, "Burning the Ships," right? Now that's not a burn t- the ships. Burn the ships, right? And and uh, yeah. so I. I don't want to tell the story because you need to tell the story and and why and what the managing piece comes out of this. So go ahead, tell the story. Burning the ships. Well, the the crux of the story is I'm always trying to get people to change and people are always trying to get me to change. And in change management, when you're trying to make a fundamental change in an organization, the first sale is always with the manager. If you can't get the manager to buy into the change, nothing's going to change. I, I struggle with it all the time. I, I used to struggle with it more, but I... I've never heard a staff member say, you know, the manager's never going to go for this change. But I always hear managers say, you know, staff are never going to go for this change. My staff will never do that. And what they're really saying is they're not convinced it's the right thing for them, so they're not going to do it. Right. And so that's really where the, the whole thing came from is where I actually had a situation where my boss came to me, wanted me to make a change. He wanted me to reduce hours. Right. He said, you know, we're working 40 hour work weeks right now and everybody else is going to a 37 and a half hour work week with employees. And, you know, we just got to get to there. Our clients are asking for some rebates and we just need to reduce staffing hours. And I could not bring myself to do it. I could not do it. I I made every excuse in the world on how my my staff couldn't get the job done if we took a half hour away from them i we couldn't be we wouldn't be able to do the quality work we were supposed to be doing uh, the whole i argued 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 finally he said my boss said after a couple of weeks he gave me a couple of weeks he said why don't you um clean up all you know do you have any personal belongings here in the office and i was like what do you mean personal belongings He's like well i'm I'm going to, you can't get this. You can't reduce the hours. I'm going to have to get somebody else who can. And all of a sudden I had a new perspective. I was like, wait, 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 wait. How many hours did you say? I think I can do it. Hold on. I didn't realize you were that serious. Wait a minute. (laughs) And it reminds me of this. It reminds me of the story of Hernan Cortez and 
when he goes down and he wants to take over the Incan Empire. And he's got 600 men, Spanish men, to 100,000 uh, Inca troops or, or, yeah, Inca warriors. And there's no way, you know, with those kind of numbers that right. you could see that they could win. But he knew that if he he ordered his ships, his, his men were like, you know, we're not going to be able to take them. We, we should wait for reinforcement. We should go back to Spain and get more people and come back. And he said, no, no, he, he ordered them to burn their ships. And when they cried, Spile, they're like, how if we burn our own ships, how do you expect us to get back? And he said, we're going to go back on their ships, meaning that if we burn our ships, we'll have no choice. Right. But to win, you will not give up. You will not quit. Right. You will see it through the end because you have to. And if you want to get home, you have to. And I know that there is some folklore legend, whether or not that's an actual true story. And it's irrelevant. It's so true in management that if you really want to change, if you have to fundamentally change a system, you have to convince the manager first. And if you, and if you can't, convince the manager you have to replace the manager you have to burn the ships you can't give them i've had so many situations where we propose change where we say listen if it doesn't work give it a few weeks if it doesn't work we can go back to the other way that is you're literally wasting your time if you're given that premise because it's never ever ever going to work as a matter of fact i gotta say i'm reading a book called about face and it's by Colonel David Hackworth. It's a Colonel David Hackworth, a warrior, just one of the greatest battlefield commanders. He was in Korea, World War One, World War Two, and in Vietnam. Really made a name for himself in Vietnam. And he has he has this thing where uh, some people were telling talking about him. He always required his managers, his lieutenants, to have a number two. So whoever who he always wanted to know who your second in command was. Mm. And the reason is because he would be talking to you, the first in command. And he said, I want you to take those troops. And I need you to take that hill over there. And you would say, listen, we've been working really hard. We've been trying for two weeks now to take that hill. It's just not possible. Colonel Hackworth would go, fine, find your number two and tell him I want him to do it. You relieve yourself of the duty. I think that is such a brilliant, <laughs> you know, you should always have an assistant just so you can, Promote the assistant and if the manager can't do what the, you need to do. <laughs> a little forced exercise. I love it. It's the same kind of thing about burning the ships. I love that. We're talking with Ralph Peterson, author of this outstanding book called Managing When No One Wants to Work. One of the other, there's some other chapters I really want to talk about here, though, because one of the ones that I just was laughing at is Muffin Man. And because, oh, the Muffin Man. Oh, um, and, and of course, uh, I think think the young man actually wrote the forward of the book and he says it really wasn't a muffin but i think that's i think that's what he says i think he <laughs> says it really wasn't a muffin but uh i think he, who you were writing about but th- 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 i'm going to kind of give a little bit of a way and i'm gonna let you tell it and so how many times have any of you out there who are listening to the show or watching the show right now have you ever dealt with somebody who got promoted to a manager and they just think they could do whatever they want that they don't have to, that they don't, you know, that they don't have to really do any work. They just kind of can just, because I'm a manager now, I can just, I can just sit back and manage. Well, this is Muffin Man. So I'm going to let Ralph go ahead, tell the story of Muffin Man, because it's a great story. It's just one of those many times where we have a new manager, like you were saying, who for one reason or another has, you know, all managers have the luxury of freedom. They have the freedom of movement. They have freedom of flexibility. They have a freedom of, of being able to take their work home essentially. So they can, if they want, they can take an extended break. They can come and go as they please. They can, but at least they certainly think they can. The problem with that is that their staff sees them in this case, eating a muffin when they're short-staffed. And that's what happened. As I walked into a facility that we were working in, and I met this new manager, first, before I meet him, I see the building, and again, I work in housekeeping, and it's dirty. It doesn't look good at all. The floors don't look good. The housekeeping doesn't look good. And when I talk to one of the, one of the employees, they say, well, we've been short-staffed for a couple of days now, and I said, okay, so well, where's the manager? Why isn't the manager pitching in? And they rolled their eyes. 
as if the manager would ever get their hands dirty. <laughs> and I got to tell you, that's the that's the number one little pet peeve of mine is if you have a disdain for the work that you're overseeing, right. you, you have, you're going to have trouble overseeing it. And in this case, if you hate housekeeping and housekeepers, you can't be an effective housekeeping manager. I mean, right. I've promoted so many people who were really super fantastic housekeepers today. I promote them, and tomorrow they come into work and with the idea, the belief that they'll never have to do housekeeping again. That's all right. Well, that's inaccurate. You, you're going to have to get your hands dirty. You're going to have right. to pitch in. And that's what I think happened here, where they're short staffed, the building doesn't look good. And I, I'm in the laundry room, and in comes this guy eating a muffin. All right, so he says it was angel food cake. What do I know? <laughs> and, and I introduce myself. We meet for a minute. And then I say, oh, I heard the floor tech, you know, that you're having problems. You're short staffed here. And he's like, yeah, yeah, we've been struggling for staff. And then he goes, I'm going to go see if I can get another muffin. And I blew a gasket. I was like, can I see you in your office for a minute? And I, I said, you, what are you doing walking around here eating a muffin? And he's like, well, because I can because I'm the manager. I'm like, no, you can't because you're the manager. It's the opposite here. It's the opposite. You, if you want to rule this, that, if you want to be in charge, if you want people to do what you need them to do, you want them to work harder, you want them not to call out. You've got to be the type of person who goes out there, grabs the buffer, helps with the floors, grabs the lot. You've got to lead from the front here. And I left there not knowing whether or not I just made him to where he's going to quit. That happens. Right. Right. Where he's like, screw this. I don't know who that guy thinks he is, but I'm out of here. That could have happened. Or if it's going to have a different effect, he's actually going to lace up his boots a little tighter and right. put the muffin down and get to work. <laughs> and thank God that's the results we had. And fast forward a couple of years, I, you know, worked with them kind of like in the fringes. We didn't ever really work together. Right. We were, although we worked for the same company, I did have a few interactions with him and he did get promoted. He was moving up the chain pretty rapidly, which I think is fantastic. I love promoting people and getting people to move up. It's I take great joy in it. There's not enough of us, not enough people who have the ability and the willingness to take charge. So I really, really respect that. And he reached out and told me how much I that day impacted him and how much he grew from that experience and how much it changed him as a manager and made him more thoughtful and more effective in the end. And so when I was redoing this book for his fifth anniversary, I just sent him a note. I said, you know, we had this conversation about it. I wonder if you'd be willing to write the forward and he jumped at it. And I, I got to say, we, we don't hear enough when we right. do good things. And not a lot of people beat down your door to tell you, Hey, that thing you did a couple of years ago for me was really fantastic. Changed my life. Right. So when somebody does do that and do that for you, it's so generous and so kind. And so it, it, the greatest story ending, right? I mean, right. Yeah. It, how do you get better than that? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, I think about, you know, times in my life growing up where I've been rebuked, <laughs> I guess that's the correct word, right? Rebuked uh, or corrected for sure. And, you know, in looking back on it, it was the best thing that they could have ever done for me right was to correct me and and i and it really is it's powerful when you're willing but you got to be willing to take it and then you got to be willing to change it right yeah ultimately and that yeah. and that's not easy for everybody to do because you know pride you, you talk about pride and it's really a two-way street there there's the one set of pride that says okay my ego's in the way and i'm not going to accept it who you think you are to tell me this we, and then there's the other side of pride that people who take pride in their work, and you talk about that in the book, about you know getting your people to take pride in your work, and that so when people are able to accept it and then change as a result of it, it's a really cool thing to know that you've impacted that that life, and I, I totally agree with you. I want to move on to another story. By the way, we're talking with Ralph Peterson, and yes, by the way, you, if you're looking at this book, and I know you people are listening on podcast. And on iHeartRadio and wherever else, I know that you cannot see the cover of this book, but literally Ralph has his uh, Fandango up in the air while his head is buried in the sand. <laughs> <laughs> I have no other way to describe that. And uh, it, it's called Managing When No One Wants to Work. And if 
you're in management, or even if let's say you're let's say you're a worker, let's just say that you know you work for somebody. Uh, these are good lessons for you too of things that you don't want to do as an employee, and and how your manager actually views you, or how the manager should be viewing you. There's actually a great uh, there's a great 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 chapter in this book, and it's a ten point thing that he actually outlines for people what they need to do when they're negotiating for a salary increase. And by the way, they're brilliant. Uh, the, 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 the points that he goes through on how to negotiate correctly for a, a salary increase is in this book. And it's it's invaluable. If you bought it for that piece alone, it was it's absolutely worth it. I'm just telling you. Uh, you can buy this book on Amazon. You can actually go to ralphpeterson.com. And it is spelled exactly how you think it's spelled. It is R-A-L-P-H. P-E-T-E-R-S-O-N. I will have that in the write-up so that you can get the book from him directly or you can get it on Amazon or your favorite bookstore because you, you, you can ask for it in your favorite bookstore. And if they don't have it, tell them, why don't you have this book? You need to have this book. This book's great. They can get it for you. They can get it. They can, they can get order it, it anywhere. Order it anywhere. You can, you can get it everywhere. Hey, folks up in Canada, I know you listen to me and I know I got people in Israel and stuff like that. Yes, we'll find a way. We can find a way. <laughs> There's always a way that we can get these books to you uh, for sure. Uh, 17 countries around the world that are downloading the show. First of all, thank you, but we can get this book to you. I promise you there's a way. That we'll find a way. Uh, you can contact Ralph. I'm sure he'll find a way to help you get this book as well. So, Ralph, one of the one of the other chapters that uh, I found extraordinarily intriguing because I love – first of all, I love the movie. I, the movie's called Groundhog Day. And I, lo- I love Bill Murray and Groundhog Day. I think is one of the best movies. It, it's one of my favorite comedy, romance comedy, rom-coms, I guess is what they call them now. It's, it, it's, it's a great movie. It's got a great message, a great story. But it's so relevant because how many of us, and again, the people who are listening to the show, watching the show, how many of you like literally walk into work and go, huh, it's Groundhog Day again, right? It's all right again. It's Groundhog Day again. It's the same thing. It's day the in same and day thing. Out. Go, Ralph. Talk to us. Through, talk us through. Same Groundhog. problems. <laughs> same challenges. Same call out. Same blinking stupid red light on the phone. Same questions. Same dirty issues. It was happening for me for over a year. Like months and months and months. I started in this nursing home and I just couldn't figure out what the problem was. It, it, it was like clockwork. Every day, same call outs, different people, same excuses. You know, this is back in the day when people actually had to call and they have to change their voice. Hello. No, I'm really sick. I don't, I don't feel like, yeah, okay. So now they text out, but they, they used to have to change their voice. We, I was having so many problems i was banging my head against the wall it was the same i just simply couldn't get staff to work if i got them to work i couldn't keep them on task i couldn't keep track of them it seemed like everything was working against me no matter what i did to try to get them corralled into one way or another it just wasn't working for me and then one day there we had this thing with cubicle curtains so we got to change their privacy curtains in nursing homes it's because you know you have two people in one room you have to have a curtain so care can be given, some little bit of privacy. And I used to get such a hard time about privacy curtains because, you know, we have them color-coded. We have two pink ones in a room if there's two women in the room or two blue ones in the room if there's two men in the room. And some of the rooms have green ones. And I was haphazard about it. I'm like, just put the pink one up. Well, it's a boy's room. I, what, we just, is it clean? All right, then put it up. And of course, somebody would come down. You can't put a pink cubicle curtain up in a boy's room. All right, all right, all right. right? And the other thing was, every time we needed a cubicle curtain, my staff would go to try to find one. And how they would do it is they'd walk out the front door. I don't know why staff have to walk out the front door to walk all the way around the building. It takes about 30 minutes to walk all the way around the building. It's a very small building, but 30 minutes all the way around the building to go to the back door to find the cubicle curtain. They go all the way. You know, of course, they're outside smoking. They're joking. They're, they're on their cell phone or whatever. And... That's when it dawned on me that I should be the one getting cubicle curtains. And that's how it started with me just being proactive, start going, wait, wait, wait. I know how to stop that. I know they're going to need a cubicle curtain. I know they're going to need a pink one. Okay. I'm going to get that for them. 
And that's exactly what happens in the movie Groundhog Day, which right. is to my absolute favorite movie. Right. That's what happens with Bill Murray. When he first gets in there and he realizes nothing's going to change, he wants, he's, first he's fun with it. It's hilarious. And then it's not funny. Right. And he wants to kill him. He wants anything to get out of it. And then he sees a kid falling out of a tree and he thinks, wait a minute, that's going to happen again tomorrow. Because if everything is happening the same all the time, I bet I can catch that kid tomorrow. And sure enough, he gets there right at the right time, and poof, he catches the kid. And then he realizes that every day, because it's always the same thing happening, there's just you know, there's a couple that's having second thoughts on marriage, and he knows how to cure that because he sees it every day. And every day he sees the same thing: these women in a car, and they get a flat tire. And every day he thinks, you know, he if he had a spare tire there, he could solve the problem for them. And he just starts doing that instead of trying to manipulate or hide from or try to commit suicide. He decides, you know what, I'm going to be proactive and solve these problems. And before you know it, it's it's February 3rd. He gets out. of It changes because mm. he changed. Mm. That's mm. what happened to me. I didn't realize for so long that everything kept happening. Nothing was changing because I didn't change. I needed to start serving my staff. I needed to start being proactive. If you know that the same problem is going to happen tomorrow that happened today, here's a tip. Do something about it. Mm. Do something about it that's going to make it better for everyone else, even if it's not going to be better for you. But you, being proactive to get stuff for your staff, that's more work on the manager, but it's worth it. Right. It pays big money, big, big money. Trust me. That's awesome. It's Ralph, Ralph Peterson, Managing When No One Wants to Work is with us, and uh, awesome book, by the way. I, I really enjoyed reading this book, Ralph. I, I told you that off the air, and I'm, I'm telling this in front of everybody. I, I had so enjoyed reading this book. This, this book was, there's a lot of highlights in yellow in this book because I just got so much out of it. And I think in that story, Ralph, uh, well, hold on, let me do this first because I've got to take care of our sponsors because if I don't, then because they pay us. Uh, it's, so we'll get back to the story. Uh, by the way, we're brought to you by the book and Ralph Peterson, the book, Managing When No One Wants to Work. And Ralph Peterson is brought to you today on a new direction by inline business brokers and advisors. They have literally helped thousands of clients in the sale and purchase of businesses. When it's time to sell your business, contact the professionals at Inline Business Brokers and Advisors. You can learn more by going to Inline.com. It's E-N-L-I-G-N.com. We appreciate them uh, being our sponsor as well as Linda Craft and Team Realtors. When you need to sell or buy your home, contact the professionals, the experts of Linda Craft and Team Realtors. They have been around since 1985 and they have been giving outstanding, not outstanding, legendary customer service in the real estate world. So check them out. Just go to lindacraft.com, L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T.com. What I was going to say about this book, I think this is where you put in the Zig Ziglar quote in the Groundhog Day uh, piece is because when you decided that you were going to change is when you start to realize that if I give if I give everybody everything that they want, then that's when I will get everything that I want. Right. Exactly, that, right. and that is the great Zig Ziglar. Yeah, and 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 I think you make that quote. And I for I got to tell you that I don't know if it's irony or not. I don't even know if that's the correct way of using irony. But the fact that you use Zig Ziglar on top of Bill Murray and Groundhog Day, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would have never made that connection. But the fact that you did and it actually really works, it was actually brilliant. And I really, I went, I was thinking about that, and I went. Oh my gosh, I don't think anybody has ever put Zig Ziglar quotes next to Groundhog Day by Bill Murray, but he just did it and it absolutely worked. It was genius. So I I, I appreciate you doing that. And we're having a lot of fun with Ralph. He's so much fun. I really enjoy uh, being with him. And this is the second time he's he's no longer a guest of the show. He's actually a friend of the show. He's part of the family of A New Direction. And so we appreciate having him on. One of the, uh, one of the chapters you have in here is I think it's a title, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, I think is what it's called, isn't it? Is it Dirty oh, Rotten Scoundrels? Oh, yes. Right? Because don't we, don't dirty we have... Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Right, a, 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 b, right, which, by the way, was another really great movie with um, Steve Martin. And, it certainly was. It was another great movie. Uh, by the way, but 
we do have sometimes in our when we're managing we actually have dirty rotten scoundrels right and that we're absolutely tr- that we're trying to manage how do we manage them well you know that's the way that this all happened was i'm always writing about management and of course if you read anything about you read any of my any of my stuff and i should put out there that i do a weekly newsletter as well so if anybody's interested in in Reading more from me every week. I do have a weekly newsletter. Well, well, people well, respond well, back. Wait, 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 stop. Well, Tell oh, people. Sorry, yes. Don't yes. just don't just say that. Tell them how they could get it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, you. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Email welcome. <laughs> email welcome at Ralph Peterson, and we'll you'll get an automatic response right back. Welcome to the Five Star Leadership Newsletter, and uh, so welcome at RalphPeterson dot com. Awesome. Okay, go ahead. Now you can do your story. That's how you subscribe to it. Yeah, I apologize. No, so I would, get, I would get people responding back, managers responding back to me. And they're like, you know, you're always writing about how we get it wrong, how managers are always getting it wrong. You know, the staff we work with are not the best staff. You know, they get it wrong, too. And so that was – it was really just my, like, I agree. I'm going to tell you – I can tell you a million stories about, ma- about our staff trying to manipulate and take advantage of other staff or and take advantage of me and take advantage of situations. And I have it all the time. And that's how that, that chapter came out, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. I was just simply writing, no, I agree. As hard as it is to get it right on the management side, you got to keep in mind that we don't work with staff that are always honest, mm-hmm. that are always have our you know best interest at heart. They, the only reason why we have managers is because staff don't do what they're supposed to be doing. As a matter of fact, I don't spend a lot of time with staff. I don't train staff. I don't, spe- I don't do seminars for staff. I only work with leaders. I'm only interested in managers. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't mean it that way. I'm not sure. being flippant. I mean, I'm, I spend all my time and effort and energy helping people who want to get better at being in charge right. get better at being in charge. That's my focus. Right. But when I do have a rare chance and have a rare meeting with a staff member and they say, how do I make more money? The answer is easy. Stop needing so much oversight because mm-hmm. all the money that you should be getting is being taken up by the manager who needs to watch you and check up in on you. Right. You got that's, that's the answer. Stop needing so much oversight. You'll be worth more money. Of right. course, when you stop needing so much more oversight, you know what you call those, right? No. Managers and training. Come here. Ah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> well played. Well played. Well played. That, 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 no, I get it. But what, I mean, when is it? When you're a manager, because I know I get people who will ask me this question, and I have a variety of answers. But when do you, when do you, you train managers? When do you say to a manager, and you wrote a little bit about this in the book too, when is it okay to fire somebody? When when do you say, you know what, we've got to let this person go, we got to let this scoundrel go? When when do you say that? You you say it when you've exhausted all other managerial abilities because you it's first of all i think it is super super important to fire people i think it's super important i don't use the term fire i tell them i say i'm going to let somebody go right but i was just watching a thing with gary vaynerchuk i don't know if you know gary oh yeah no, oh, gary is, v, we all a, know gary v, a, yeah yeah he, he's he's really a great uh, entrepreneur a real business savvy and he was just talking about company culture when it comes to hiring and firing. And he made a great point where hiring is guessing. If you're hiring somebody, it's a guess. You, you don't know if they're going to be a good worker. You don't know if they're going right. to work out or they're going to have your best interest at heart. But firing is based on knowledge. You know they're not a good worker. You know they're not going to do anything really well. And so I think firing is super important and it should be done as soon as you know that you've done everything. Do you remember... Do you remember years ago? I think the show's still on, but I remember when it first started. It was a show called Grey's Anatomy. Sure, sure. And it's a medical show, right. you know, drama, high drama. I remember when it first started. And they have the first. It was all about the interns, or the the internship. These doctors, they're just out of college and or medical school, and they have to work in a actual hospital, and they're dealing with real emergencies of real lives. And one of the first early episodes. The chief medical doctor, they had a patient come in who was expired. He had passed away. And so these young students, they're like, well, he's expired. And she says, 
well, did you try this? Well, no, because we don't think, well, you got to go try this. So they go, all right. So they try this procedure. But of course, the guy's already expired or there's no chance of saving them. Right. And so then they come back. No, we tried that, that. That didn't work. She goes, well, did you try this other thing? And she rattles off like four or five things that she wants them to try. And when they, they, they think it's ridiculous because there's no save in the sky. And so sure enough, they're right. They do and they try all these four or five different procedures. Then they come back. They finally lost them. And they and she said, now, do you see? And then they have to go and talk to the family right. and say to the family, uh, let them know that this person expired. And that's when they learned the lesson that the reason they tried these things that were ridiculous is so that they could go to the family and said, we tried everything mm. because indeed they did. Mm. They tried everything. I think that's the same way with firing people. You mm. have to try everything. I try everything is all right up until saying. Do you, if what, the only thing I can think of to do now is just to let you go. I mean, is right. that the answer? I mean, right. what would you do? You know what I mean? Like, how how else should we play this? Right. Well, but I well no, no the, I I agree with you. But you know, there's the old adage, right, that we've had in business that says fire fast, hire slow. Yeah. But that's but that's I not ne- that but that's not necessarily true because. You don't necessarily fire fast if you haven't done. If you haven't, I mean, there's there's a chapter in the book where the lady was going to fire the 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 chef, and and you say, well, did you have a conversation, right? Did you exactly. did you did you talk to the person first? Because you, you have exactly a, right. I mean, so and of course she didn't. The chef wound up being outstanding. She got fired, <laughs> which is hilarious. <laughs> that's right. Which that is hilarious. Very, very, which happens a lot, by the way. That's. <laughs> happens more than you would think it really does happen. No, you're absolutely right. So firing fast is a relative term. Right. It just simply means you shouldn't be per- tolerating poor performance right. for months and months and months. Right. It should be addressed quickly. Right. Right. It should be addressed quickly. Yeah, no. That's, and it, that's really what it's all about. Yeah, no, I, I get it. We're talking with Ralph. I do. I understand it. I get it so much because it's hard. It's Firing is hard. It really, it, the more you know, it really is hard because you know that you're, you know, you know that right now, at least at this moment, you have that person's livelihood in your hands, and that they're going to have to find something else. And I think that makes it difficult. To it really does, and really, you're right. It well, this does because, you know, nobody wants nobody wants to do it. But I also have to go listen. What I don't correct, I accept. And there's certain right. there's certain behavior that I cannot accept in my business, right? And so I have to correct it, and that does mean at times, if I've if I've exhausted all the surgical options of trying to get you to do what I need you to do, such as wear a uniform, uh, another chapter that you wrote about, <laughs> right? uh, to, to to wear a uniform. If if I've exhausted all those options, you've le- you are the one who is actually responsible, leaving me no other option, because of your behavior. That's right. Yeah. Right. That's and, right. And firing if, is um. Go ahead. Firing is tricky. What it is, but I think managers. I think managers take it so personally, right? And and mm-hmm. you got to Q-tip it, right? Q-tip it. Quit taking it personally, right? Hand a Q-tip. You got you can't take it personally when you have to do that because sometimes it is necessary if you've exhausted all the surgical options that you had at your availability to try to surgically repair the employee or even a manager because you're in a, you're in a case where you have to fire managers on occasion. Absolutely. I only fire managers right. generally. I I again, I'm only disciplining. I only write up managers. And could you imagine that? I write up a lot of managers, and the write-up is because they didn't write up their staff. I mean, can you imagine getting in trouble for not, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you're getting written up for not writing up staff. Like, that seems ridiculous. <laughs> it does seem but ridiculous. It, but it happens all the time. Right. And they're like, so if I wrote that person up, I wouldn't be getting written up. I'm like, of course. If you were managing appropriately, I wouldn't have to manage you appropriately. Yes, that's how it works. That's, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's so Game true. Game on. Yeah well, yeah. You, well, you talk about that too, right? I mean, did you write the person up? No. Well, then I'm going to write you up. What? <laughs> what? What do you mean you're going to write me up? Well, you're supposed to write the person up. Well, why are you going to write me up? Because you didn't write the person up. That's why I'm writing you up. And you talk about that in your book as well. The book is amazing, folks. You're listening to Ralph. We've just, by the way, Ralph, we've already been on an hour. 
Oh my. I can't. Sorry about that. I, no. How long were we supposed to go? <laughs> we're an hour. We, we go an hour, but it goes so right, fast. Good. It goes so fast. I could keep going with you for a while because it's just so fast and it's so much fun. And the, this book, Managing When No One Wants to Work, is so good. And you're hearing just bits and pieces. You're hearing the. Thanks, Tom, for calling it a great show. It means a lot to Ralph and I that uh, you said it's a great show. Appreciate that hearing from Excellent. you. Excellent. Uh, but this book is a toolkit book. It's got so much in store for you. I don't care what you're doing. If you're managing anything, I don't even care if you're trying to manage your family, okay? If you're even trying to manage your family, there's something in here in this book for you. If you're trying to manage your dogs and your cats because you're single and that's the only thing you manage in your house, I'm telling you, you're going to get something out of this book. The book is an enjoyable read. It is a fun read. It is a read that will grow you. It will challenge you. It'll make you think. And it was one of those reads that I just uh, just really enjoyed, and I'm so glad that he wrote it. And you can get this on Amazon. You can go to ralphpeterson.com. Matter of fact, you could sign up for his management newsletter by just going to, and I think it's welcome at ralphpeterson.com. It is. Welcome at ralphpeterson.com. And if yep. you email that to him, then you can be part of his management newsletter. And also, if you're somebody who's looking for a great speaker, uh, somebody who is part of the National Speakers Association. He's a professional member like I am. If you're looking for someone who is a great speaker that you want to talk about management issues or a variety of issues of dealing with people, I really highly recommend that you get Ralph, uh, give Ralph a call and talk to him because he's a fabulous speaker. And as you've been listening, he's got a great sense of humor and he's a lot of fun and he's perfect uh, for whatever venue. And if you're, you're going to be in... West Virginia okay. on the 22nd of this month. I'm the keynote for the West Virginia Healthcare Association. So really? if you belong to healthcare, if you're administrator, West Virginia are close by. Keynote. So, you, so can they say can they say hi? Of course. Right. Can, please, I, please, okay, absolutely. So, so this is what 22nd of May. You're going to be doing this. It is. Yes. Okay. So May 20. May 22nd, yes. and we're at in Virginia. It's in Morgantown. Morgantown, Morgantown, Virginia. West Virginia. Okay, Morgantown, West Virginia. West Virginia. Okay, Morgantown, West Virginia, May 22nd. Ralph is going to uh, be the keynote speaker um, for a health care conference. If you're listening to the show and you're going to be there or if you've listened to a new, watched a new direction or wherever you heard about a new direction, if you're going there, why don't you go hit up Ralph and say, I heard you on a new direction, loved you and loved the show. Can't. I brought my book with me. Will you sign it? Please. And I promise you, Ralph will do that, right? Because I know you. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll do that. So, As a matter of fact, I'll give you one more. The the um, the association, the West Virginia Association, they are so awesome that they are providing a copy of my book, Congratulations, Now Get Over Yourself, to every attendee. There that's another reason to go. See, that's another reason to go. You know what? If you said, that's right. I, I don't know. You get a free if, book. I, I don't know if I'm going to go. Mm, well, guess what? They're going <laughs> to They're going to give away a free book. That's going to put you over the edge. I promise you. The congratulations, get over yourself. Great, fun book again, just like this one. Ralph, I asked you the first time that we do this, and we're going to do this again. I hope I hope that's okay. That sometime we're going to be able to do uh, this show again because I, I, I not this show, but to do another show in the future because I of just course. I so enjoy you on the show. You are so much fun, and you make my job so easy, and I I'm so grateful for that. But I asked you the first time, I'll ask you this time, the show's called A New Direction because we try to help people find a new direction in their life or their career or their business. If you could leave people with a new direction when it comes to managing, uh, when no one wants to work, will you give folks a new direction? I will. I have a, I'm going to tell you, let me tell you something. I just gave a manager a hundred dollar raise without spending any money. I just gave a manager a hundred dollar raise without spending any money. And this is what happened. I knew the manager was going to be running a little late. I suspected they were going to be running a little late. And the reason I suspected is because I see that their staff is running a little late every morning. Their staff is not actually, they start at seven, but they're not actually getting to their units until seven 30, seven 40. And in my head, the only reason that happens is because the manager maybe is getting a little bit behind. And so I'm sure to be there at 7 a.m., a little bit before 7 a.m., just because I want to make sure that the manager's getting there on time. And sure enough, the manager's not there. Instead, 
the manager shows up about 7.15, and all the staff are just hanging around, waiting for the manager. And so I say, you know that old adage? There used to be an adage that said, we used to, you have to praise publicly and reprimand privately. Right. Well, let me tell you, if you want to give your manager a raise, this is what you do. You find them just having a little bit of an ineffective practice. She's not a bad manager. She's a good manager, but she's being ineffective because she wasn't managing her time right. Because she wasn't managing her time, her staff were not managing their time. They were getting there on time, but they weren't going to work on time. And so I was there a little early. I see that she comes in at 7.15. She sees me, and of course, she turns white as a ghost because I'm there. And I say, why are you late? She's like, well, I had to take an Uber in. And, you know, so I'm like, okay, why is everybody standing around? They're standing around because you're late. You have to be here on time or they're going to be waiting for you, waiting for direction. They need to get to their units on time. You have to be here. She's like, I know I'm, I'm, it won't happen again. Now, I leave. How did I just give her a $100 raise? I just gave her a $100 raise because if she was struggling at all with getting them to listen to her and have her exert some authority, she just got dressed down a little bit by me in front of them. So all of a sudden she's empowered to go, let's go up there. I'm not getting in trouble by Ralph again. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. Mm. And I just put her in a position where everybody else sees it. She's not getting away with it because she's in charge. Too often our managers are getting taken liberties. They're like, well, I'm in charge, so I can leave a little early. I can come in a little late. I can take my break anytime I want. And that is dangerous. And it's, it's actually hurting your ability to lead because everybody else goes like, well, if that was me or if I did that. So by, by addressing that, by catching her and by addressing it in front of everybody, letting everybody know that she's no different. She is going to be held by the same rules. They respect all of leadership more. Mm. And she becomes more effective. Mm. It's like getting a hundred dollar raise. I'm telling you, it's the same thing. Mm. That's awesome. His name's Ralph Peterson. And you've been listening to the show. It's a new direction in, in his book, Managing When No One Wants to Work. And he just left you with a new direction. F- folks, this is the show. And Ralph has been awesome. And he joined us again. And I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful. By the way, I just want to thank everybody out there who listens to the show. And you know whether you're in your car or whether you watch us on Facebook or whether you're in Israel. By the way, I, I can't believe that so many people are downloading the show in Israel. But I really do appreciate you. Uh, so much and all these uh, 17 countries in around the world are downloading the show and I am so grateful for all of you for doing that it's it's really means so much to me and you don't know how what it means to my uh, the authors that I get to interview that that there's people around the world who get to listen to the show and even here in the great country that we live in called the United States we are so grateful for everybody all over who listens to the show whether it's in New York City or Chicago or LA or even in the small towns in the Midwest we just appreciate you so much and and so we thank you for that folks the show is called a new direction because we're trying to help you find a new direction in your life career and business and Ralph Peterson has blessed us with that today and especially when it comes to both your career and your business he's hit both and actually even your life to make you even a better person and that's what we try to do so as I leave you I say every week be inspired because when you're inspired you can inspire others And when we do that, we can make this world an amazing place. I will see you next week with another great guest. Ciao, everybody. When you lost your confidence And the answers don't make sense Got to keep your hope alive You got to know you can survive This is your time Find your strength.